The main text is going to still be from 1 Peter. But I do want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 first this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Because I need to give you a little bit of background to make sure that we don't misunderstand some important things. We left off in 1 Peter chapter 2 last week with honor the king. And when you consider that when Peter penned this epistle, when he wrote this epistle of 1 Peter, Nero was the king. He was Caesar in Rome. And if you know anything about Nero at all, he was one of the most wicked, awful, <coughs> crazed rulers in the history of the world. If you know anything about Nero at all. And for Peter to write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, honor the king during this time was, of course, radical. And what we're about ready to read as we continue on through 1 Peter chapter 2 is even more <coughs> radical because Peter tells servants, slaves, to be submissive even when they're mistreated because they belong to Christ. So what we're ready to read in a few minutes is going to feel and seem quite radical to us today. So some say, well, does the Bible promote slavery? Anybody ever ask you that question? Have you ever considered? Because some, some have, for over the centuries, have went back and said, yeah, the Bible's okay with slavery. <laughs> the Bible does not. And it does not promote slavery. However, it does acknowledge the existence of it in the Roman world in the first century. It does acknowledge the existence of slavery. But it doesn't promote it. That's what we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look, if you will, in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. Very important we understand this, and we're not going to understand 1 Peter chapter 2. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordained in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. The Bible says very clearly, if you're a slave and you can be made free, if you can have your freedom, use it. It is good. Okay? But the point of it is, the point of this message here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and in 1 Peter chapter 2 is simply this. Church, listen. <clears throat> as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, our relationship and our loyalty to Jesus Christ supersedes everything else. Amen. That's the point. It doesn't matter what your cultural background is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter about your politics. Your faith in Jesus Christ overrides everything else. Even in the ancient world in the first century, even if you were a slave and a Christian, you need to understand that you are free in Christ. You are a Christ free man. And if you're free, like we Americans know we are, and we're thankful for that. We have to understand, even though we are free, we're still a slave of Christ. Did I read that wrong? Look at verse 21. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. We were bought at a price. Don't become slaves of men. 
Do not become slaves of men. Don't get so caught up in whatever you feel like your allegiance or your loyalty is in this world. It all is, and Paul says, you know, all that he had accomplished in Judaism, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and everything you, he counted as garbage. Remember that? It's dung, it's garbage. I count it all as garbage to pursue the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we have to understand before we can understand 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> so let's turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25. We'll read the text. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Because Peter addresses the same thing. But remember, Peter's saying all allegiances, anything that you have, you've got to submit it to God. <coughs> and Peter here challenges us today to submit the ultimate temptation of the idol of self. The idol of self. That has to be submitted to Jesus Christ as well. Radical teaching. Yes, you better believe it. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Follow along with me as I read from the New King James translation. Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was a seat found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. You were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Oh God, we thank you for this, your word. But we confess, oh Lord, as people, this seems unattainable. We confess, oh Lord, as people, especially in our American culture today in the 21st century, it's too big of a bridge to cross. How in the world can we serve you through suffering? Oh God, please, help us to understand and to look unto Jesus Christ, to look to Jesus, to look at his example, to acknowledge that he is Lord, he is Lord, of our lives. He is Lord of the church. And we have allegiance to Him. And we are ambassadors. For him. Oh God, please have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon me, upon your people. For I need you, Lord, to preach this message. I can't communicate these truths on my own power, Lord. I can't do it. I need you. Lord, your people need you to help understand and help apply this. But Lord, we know you will. Because you are faithful and you are good. And you are the shepherd of your church. Shepherd us now, we pray. In the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Maybe see you. The title of the message, Serving Through Suffering. And our flesh, my flesh, and I know I think your flesh, we don't like either one of those two words. We don't like serving, our flesh doesn't like serving, and our flesh certainly doesn't like suffering. But when you combine them together, serving through suffering, which is what the Bible is teaching here, they seem so overwhelming. But let's get started. 
if we will, in verses 18 through 20. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For it's commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? Everybody does that. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. This is number one. Number one step. Serving through suffering can only be achieved through a knowledge of God. You've got to have a knowledge of God before you can serve Him through suffering. It cannot be done without a knowledge of God. That word conscience is simply a combination of two Latin words. It means with knowledge. Con and science. It's with knowledge. Conscience of God. Conscience that God is with us. That God sees us. That God is observing all of our steps and all of our ways and acknowledging God's presence. In our lives. Every moment of every day. This is what the Bible is talking about. With a conscience and knowledge toward God. You can endure grief and suffer wrongfully. Are we knowledgeable of God's presence in our lives? Or just people's? Or just people's? We're certainly conscious of other people's presence in our lives, aren't we? We're certainly conscious, conscious of... If, if you see someone in the grocery store, or you see someone out in public, you're conscious, you see them, and you have knowledge, they see you. I don't know how many times, you know, sometimes I've watched people, as a pastor, when I come into their home, you know, they're conscious of everything when I go to visit them. And I, I bet you the place is cleaner than it has been in years when the pastor comes to visit them. <laughs> I watch people at weddings, you know, wedding receptions. After the wedding's over with, you know, and, then, and the pastor always needs to hang around to at least bless the food. But if alcohol served the wedding, I've watched people, you know, if they see the pastor. <laughs> I mean, how many times, maybe, uh, if, I, I, hope, I hope my pastor couldn't see or hear me. I hope my brother and sister in Christ, you know, they're not over here, you know, uh, this, this would be embarrassing. Hey, God's always, always there. Amen. And God always sees. Amen. And God always knows. Amen. Hebrews 4.13, look at it in your outline. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You don't have to give any accounting to me. When it's all over with, you know who you're going to get an account of your life to? Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So am I. We're all going to be accountable to Him. He is, he is the final judge. And, and His eyes are open. And nothing is hidden to Him. So therefore, we have to live in a way that we have a knowledge or conscience of God in our lives. And a good Old Testament example of this is Joseph. Remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife? In Genesis chapter 39, I believe. Potiphar's wife, Potiphar had made Joseph head of over, he was, he was steward of everything he had. And, and, and Potiphar didn't even know all that he had. He just knew the bread that he ate. He trusted Joseph so much, completely with all of his household. And Potiphar's wife began casting longing eyes at Joseph. She continued to tempt him. Lie with me, lie with me. Joseph kept avoiding her. But finally one day in the house, when, when everybody else was gone, she took a hold of his garment, remember? And he fled away, but she held his garment. And then, out of anger and scorn, she accused him to her husband and said, This Hebrew, who you brought to be with us and over his house, look what he did. He assaulted me. And Potiphar threw him, remember, into the prison. You know what Joseph said to her when, when she was sitting there? You know what he said? He said, I quote, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say sin against Potiphar, although it would have been a wrong against Potiphar. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? 
What an example to us. Joseph understood God was present. God was watching and God was in control of his life. And he could not sin and do this wickedness uh, before God. But yet he was falsely accused. And there's no record in the Bible that we see in Genesis, there's no record I can find that Joseph, that Joseph argued with Potiphar and debated with him and, and you know, share, tried to share all of his innocence. Potiphar just threw him in prison. And he was in prison, in an Egyptian prison for over two years. Over two years. Wow, what a, what a hard two years that must have been for Joseph. Lord, I've, I've been sold by my brothers, by my own brothers into slavery. And here I am. I was, I was climbing out. I was doing better. I, Potiphar had made me head of all of his household. Things were looking better. And now here I am in prison falsely accused. Where are you at, God? Joseph had to be struggling with these things. But we know after two years, we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know the rest of the story. Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph properly interpreted it. And God set Joseph the second leader over all of Egypt to save not only the children of Israel, not only the nation of Israel, but all of the region from famine. Because Joseph understood that God was with him. And he had a knowledge that God had a knowledge of all of his steps. We have to understand this. This is the only way that we can suffer in serving is know that God is watching and God loves us and God cares for us and God has a good plan for this. And we have even a better example than Joseph, don't we? We have our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, if you will, in verse 21. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. For to this you were called. You were called to this, Christian. Called to what, you may ask? Called to do good and suffer and take it patiently. <laughs> oh, wow, that's quite a calling. Have you ever considered that? That is our calling as Christians to do good and, and suffer for it many times, but take it patiently. Did I, did I read it wrong, church? Look at verse 20. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God, for to this, for to this you were called. What we're called to do. So point number two, Christians are called to serve through suffering. We are. It's not my opinion. It's not what I like to see. In my flesh, I don't like to see verses 20 and 21, but this is what we were called to because Christ set the example for us. We are called to serve through suffering. And for three years on his time on this earth, our Lord Jesus taught his disciples that they must lead by serving and serve by suffering. You know, they kept arguing about who was the greatest. Peter's the greatest. No, James, James, John. We're, we're the greatest. Who's the, who's the most greatest disciple? What did Jesus say? Hey, hey guys, listen to me. If you want to be the greatest, become a servant. For he who is the greatest is a servant of all. And remember the example Jesus said to him when he washed your feet? Peter was so appalled, like, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if you, if you don't want me to wash your feet, Peter, you have no part of me. You have no part of me. You see, he set the example for him. Hey, you've got, if you want to lead, you've got to serve. And if you want to, if you want to serve, you have to suffer. You know, we can compare and contrast the life of of Peter and Jesus. And I, I, I want you to do that as you turn. Please keep it place in first Peter. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at this because we've got to remember the man Peter used to be because after all, he authored this epistle, First Peter we're reading. Right? Now we know the Holy Spirit inspired him, so all Scripture is written by God, is written by the Holy Spirit, but still, God used human authors. He used human men and their experiences. And we have to remember the man Peter used to be and he, he, he lived with Christ and, and he was taught by Christ and he saw Christ's example for three years. And remember this? Matthew chapter 16. Let's pick up at verse 17. After Peter makes this great profession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember that? 
Jesus answered and said to him in Matthew 16, 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. See that? Suffer many things. From the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He told them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you Lord that it should happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each one according to His works. Right after Peter made that great profession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, then He takes Jesus aside and says, No, you can't suffer and die. What are you talking about? And Jesus rebukes him and says, No, Peter, you don't understand. I'm going to suffer because I am following the will of God and I'm serving my Father through suffering. And you know what? If anyone else wants to come after me, they got to do the same thing. You see that in verse 24? you got to deny yourself. Take up the cross. Now serve, serve me through suffering. You think Peter got that? Well, let's go over to Chapter 26. In Matthew's Gospel. Think Peter got this? Chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 31. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Then Jesus said to them all, His disciples, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written... I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, Even if all were made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. They came to arrest Jesus. And look at verse 51 of Matthew 26. Look at verse 51. John identifies that the one who was with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. John identifies him as none other than Peter. When Jesus was there, before they came, when they came to arrest him, Peter was ready. He was ready. And he drew a sword. And the Bible says he cut off the ear. I believe, logically, he was aiming for the middle of the head, and he missed. And he cut off the right ear. You know, Jesus healed the ear and said, what? Peter, put your sword away. Those who take up the sword shall die by the Perishment. But Peter was ready then. He was ready to die. But when Jesus was arrested, when he was taken away by the, by the Jews and the Romans, Peter began, this isn't part of the script. This is not supposed to happen, Lord. I'm sure Peter was thinking of Old Testament imagery when they came to arrest Jesus, and he thought about maybe Gideon and his 300, and he thought about David and Goliath, and he thought, well, surely, surely Jesus will help us to defeat these Romans and these Jewish guards, surely the Messiah, he is the Messiah. This is the time when he's going to establish this kingdom. I'm ready. 
But when Jesus didn't do that and was instead allowed himself to be arrested and taken away to be crucified, what happened to Peter? Oh, his confidence began to erode. And of course, you know what happens next, don't you? In verse 69, in verse 69 of Matthew chapter 26, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70 of Matthew 26, but he denied it before them all. And he said, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he, he denied it again with an oath. He swore. I do not know the man. He took an oath. Maybe he took an oath by the temple. We don't know. But he took an oath. He said, I don't know the man. And a little while later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. I don't think he was from Princeton, West Virginia. But he was a Galilean, and they could tell his accent wasn't right. You're, you're one of them Galileans. Look at verse 74. Then he began to curse. He began to curse. And swear. Saying, I do not know the man. And what happened? Immediately. Could you imagine how Peter felt? And Peter remembered the word of Jesus. <coughs> And said to him, before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. And, and Peter went out and did, he, well, he, he wept bitter. I don't blame him. Why did Peter deny Jesus? He didn't want to suffer. He, he didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to be arrested. He didn't want to be thrown into prison. You see, Jesus did not help when they came to arrest him and Jesus had been taken away and now he was waiting trial and Peter was afraid and Peter didn't want to suffer. But what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Let's look at his example, if you will, in chapter 27. Chapter 27. And look at verse 11. Chapter 27, verse 11, Matthew. Look at Jesus' example. Jesus, we've seen Peter. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he answered, Nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, Not, not one word. So the governor marveled greatly. Verse 27. Going down to verse 27 of Matthew 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around them. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him in the head. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off him. Put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Verse 39. Verse 39, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and then we'll believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. What do we see? We see our Lord Jesus Christ serving God the Father through His suffering. And when we read the account, the true account of how people mocked Him and spat upon Him, and we think, we know with one thought, Jesus could have destroyed them all. 
But he didn't. But he didn't. And now here Peter is in his 60s. And he's about ready to be martyred by Nero. And Peter's come through a whole lot in his life. But you know one thing that Peter remembers? And one thing Peter's confident of? Peter knows that the example that Jesus Christ set for him, the example of serving through suffering, is the example that he must follow. And the example that all Christians must follow. We may not like it in our flesh. We hate it. But it is what we are called to do. And to take it patiently. And you say, how can we do that? Look at verse 23. This is how we can do it. But when he, Jesus, was reviled, we saw that, right? When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. We saw that. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He didn't threaten. But what did he do? He committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed himself to God. Third point, like Jesus, Christians must, we have to commit ourselves to God. We have to commit ourselves to God, just like our Lord Jesus Christ did. Peter understood this now. After all this time, after all these decades, he finally understood that to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, we have to serve Christ through suffering. Even if you're a slave, Peter said, even if you're beaten for doing good and, and your, your master is harsh and cruel, you have to serve God and commit yourself to God. Because Genesis 18.25, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Abraham believed that, do we? Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For his written vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. We have to commit ourselves to God who judges righteously. And you may be wondering, Oh, pastor, okay, I understand the example, but how does this apply to my life because I'm not a slave? I'm a free American. This is too big of a cultural bridge to cross. And you know, many the theologians and pastors say the only way it's applicable to, to us in 21st century America or, or 20th century America is the employer and employee relationship. Okay. Maybe we can apply it to our family. Maybe we're falsely accused by family members, by loved ones. Maybe our children, maybe our parents, whatever. All of these ways we can apply it. But there's a better way. I'm not saying you can't apply it all those. There's a better way. There's a better way. When you suffer, commit yourself to God. And Christian, you will suffer. Because the Bible says we commit ourselves to God. I'm trying to do that. But I'm struggling. When Sheila had her struggle a little over a year ago, it just about destroyed me. And I would like to say I got it all cleared up in a month or two months or three months. But I'll share it with you. I still struggle. And I still question, and I still sometimes get angry at God. Yeah, your pastor sometimes gets angry at God. Because men, you understand, you don't want your wife to suffer. Gentlemen, you understand what I'm talking about. You don't want to see your wife in pain. But God's patiently taught me. Sometimes. You must serve me, and you must serve my people by suffering. Sometimes. It's required. 
Are you willing to commit? Sheila? To me? Are you willing West to let go? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to serve me? Are you going to serve me?